This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. My name is Angelica Slinska. I'm your host, and I'm joined today by Hayley Fuller, who is an early year specialist. Thank you very much, Hayley, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm looking forward to talking more about everything transition. Yes, yes. So we're going to be discussing transitions to school um, in terms of getting children ready, but also families and educators. So kind of really looking at it in a broader sense. Um, So Hayley, I thought we'd start off with um, you kind of telling us a little bit about yourself because I introduced you as earlier specialist, but actually that includes many different roles it does <laughs> so yes um, I'm an earlier specialist I've been an earlier specialist for 20 years now mm-hmm. um, I also am a, the founder of creative teaching ideas which is a platform on Facebook and Instagram and it's aimed at providing low-cost resources and activity ideas for early mm-hmm. educators to use in the classroom because as we know everything amounts up for those resources yes. that continuously going through so I'm mm-hmm. um, free to, to check that out. And I'm also have whole qualifications in child psychology, um, with my main topic being about children's self-regulation and emotional skills. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. also writing a book currently. So oh, very um, exciting. Yes, all about that topic as well. So there's a few things going on. Um, mm-hmm. and if anyone else is interested, I have a website simply called <laughs> hayleyfuller.co.uk. Feel free to go and have a look at that. Um, and I also do some freelance writing. So I've got some articles on there actually talking about what we're doing today and other ideas and things like that, all mm-hmm. aimed at early years educators. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like you said, lots of different roles <laughs> across <laughs> early childhood. <laughs> and do you, um, you teach as well, don't you? So you're currently um, on am. the summer holidays. That's it. We're currently on the summer holidays and I also teach at a local school in Wakenham. Mm-hmm. OK, well, I think it will be really interesting to kind of hear um, your work with the children and families and, and the, the team they have around you. So um, in terms of transitions, it's I think it, it would really make sense to kind of start off with the children, because that's you know what we always say. We're, we're getting children ready for school, mm-hmm. getting them ready for reception. Um, but then it's important to kind of flip that narrative and say, well, actually, how do we as educators get ready for children coming in? How do families get ready for children for their their child um, going to reception. Um, but what does, in terms of preparing um, children for that school transition, what does it look like in your setting from that child's perspective? Like, how do they get ready to go to reception? Yes, well, lots of schools do it in many different ways. And the school that I'm working at at the moment, we do it in a way where we have lots and lots of uh, time where children can come in and get to know the setting before. So mm-hmm. we hold open mornings where first the children come and do some stay in play sessions with their parents uh, originally so they can come and get Mm -hmm. used to classrooms or a two-form entry school and then uh, they they do that for about an hour and then we invite them back in uh, a couple of weeks later on to have a stay and play without their parents Mm -hmm. into classrooms and again get to know get to you know get used to the setting and the teachers and the teaching assistants um, without their parents there. So that's their first glimpse of what it could be like without the parents. And it's that mm-hmm. point that as educators, we can assess, you know, how children are settling, whether they have any attachment styles, you know, anxious mm-hmm. attachment styles, or, you know, whether they have any other needs that we pick up on. I think it's a, and it's a lovely way in order to get to know them before they officially start. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, before all of that, um, we do uh, transitions with the nursery. So if they're in a nursery setting or childminders or even home visits, we go mm-hmm. with children and get to know them a lot more before they join. Because, you know, even though reception is the starting point for the school, most children have obviously started their educational journey way, way before that. Mm-hmm. So very, yeah. very important to get that information from their you know preschool settings. Uh, so that you're secure on, you know, what you can help them with going forward. 
Mm -hmm. And what kind of things, when you say what you can help them with moving forward, what what does that look like? Because you've already mentioned attachments and children feeling safe and secure, which is the most important thing, really. Is there anything else, I guess, more specific skills wise? Because that is something that a lot of educators talk about, but actually it often becomes the bigger focus. It does. I know it does. So I think, you know, naturally parents tend to worry a lot about children's Mm -hmm. attachment styles um some children will naturally come into the classroom and it's like they've been there already for a year <laughs> other children yeah. need a lot more support but um we'll leave that to one side and I'll talk about others the other things that we help to get them ready with so if we're talking mm-hmm. to pre settings or parents if they haven't been at a preschool setting before childminder first point of course usually how independent is the child and what mm-hmm. they need help accessing still so you might have children who still need a lot of help going to toilet you Mm -hmm. you know very simple things like that you might have children who still you know need help dressing so obviously some advice to parents would be all the usual help your children with that before they start but don't feel afraid or or worried if your children are behind in that because Mm -hmm find you know early as educators we're very well versed in helping children we're not suddenly gonna expect them to come into a classroom and be well no we're not helping you now you can do it all yourself <laughs> you know that's not our role our role is to support children at each developmental stage and you know children sometimes will get it quickly sometimes they'll need a bit more help another thing mm-hmm. that I usually get from the preschool settings is any um additional needs so if children need any help support with their emotional development for example Mm -hmm. um and how they strategies they have used uh and then Mm -hmm. you know things that we can carry forward into our settings um and also of course any um special educational needs as well so Mm -hmm. the children or the child you know is on an ehcp plan or whether they've got an individualized learning plan and what we can Mm -hmm. do to help that in our setting going forward um, because I've, I'm sure you're aware there's a huge influx now of children coming into schools with mm. real diverse needs. Um, yeah. I think obviously it stemmed a lot from COVID and having that time. So it's making sure we're picking up the pieces from that and allowing mm. the children to have that, yeah, as you said, that safe, secure environment where they're being fully supported individually. Mm-hmm. And I can hear that a lot of your teaching really is influenced by the psychology side of your kind of work and experience because you as I said straight away you mentioned attachment styles and children feeling secure so does does that really kind of play a big role day to day in what you do like is it constantly something that is in the back of your mind I guess a lens through the way you see children and families uh yeah I mean I would say it's probably the most the, the biggest most important thing you can do to support children in the early years year in the reception year in the in, in the mm-hmm. um, help them with their emotional development um because without having that emotional awareness or being supported in that area you'll find children will find other areas extremely hard to access so mm-hmm. I would say the most important skill you can foster for a child is helping them with their personal social and emotional education and as mm-hmm. obviously early as educators we know this, we see it every single day in the classroom and it can have such a broad and wide variety of yeah. need children um, and how we can help them with this. So it's ext- I feel it's extremely important. In fact, I'd, I'd probably say it's the most important area that you can support a child with. Mm-hmm. And when you, uh, no doubt you must have um, families come to you and say, my child um, is not able to kind of write yet or form their letters or, or count to a certain number. What, what, how do you have that conversation with them in terms of reassuring them, I guess, um, that it's it's important to have that secure attachment, it's important to have the personal social emotional skills um, before all the other more formal skills? Absolutely, no, and, and that is so true. I mean, of course, I think parents will naturally be concerned because they hear the word school and they automatically... Yeah reading it's writing it's maths well actually within the early years as we know it's the holistic child and it's Mm -hmm. the curriculum so every single area is of equal importance if not more um so some of the things I will say to parents is please you know do not worry if your children haven't even got an interest yet in holding a pencil or drawing Mm -hmm. or writing the most important thing you can do for that child is 
one to speak very positively about more academic things like drawing writing and encourage it through mm-hmm. play so making sure you know you're getting chalks out you're doing it on the on the you know driveway at home or mm-hmm. you know things like that make sure you do your gross motor skills they are far 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 more important than forcing a child to pick up a pencil and write before they're ready mm-hmm. and usually if a child is displaying the reluctance to do that draw right it's probably because their muscle is not their muscles are not quite ready to even go to yeah. that stage yet and that's mm-hmm. okay I think there's such a lot of pressure put upon parents to make their children feel they've got to, to hit certain targets before they start school when it's mm-hmm. not about that you know especially when it comes to writing and drawing it's mm-hmm. at every child's level and it's okay for your child for one child to be oh well yeah my my child's been writing their names since they were three and mm-hmm. then another child, as I said won't even pick up a pencil it's all normal it's all really really normal and please don't feel pressured in order to get your child to do that. Everyone will do it. Every mm-hmm. you, Everyone will learn to read and write and do maths in their own time. It's more important to make sure you're being very positive about this with your child. And you're, as I said, you're working hard to develop those muscle memories, fine and gross motor through play and through other activities that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. So they're developmentally um, ready and it's developmentally appropriate rather than children kind of being pressured into, yeah, Mm -hmm. these things. I guess um, starting school, starting reception is really seen as the child needs to be ready to be a school child. But actually it's in reception we are preparing that child to be um, ready for school when they are in reception no they're not they're not there yet it is the purpose of that year isn't it I guess it's communicating that to parents really yeah yeah I couldn't agree more you know it's not they suddenly start reception and they're you know expected to you know read a, read a certain level of books or have a certain standard of being able to sit and listen or keep mm-hmm. still or you know things like that you know the reception year is truly about developing the whole child and making sure that they are progressing in their own rate and at their own time without the pressure Mm -hmm. of, you know, thinking, well, they've all got to reach a certain level. Yes, you know, you know, at the end of the reception, we have something called a good level of development, which we expect all children to hopefully reach in terms of what we call Mm -hmm. a normal, um, a normal way of developing for a child. But it's so much more important to not put pressure upon that because it's so broad and wide the Mm -hmm. you know a good level of development that as long as you're supporting that child in their individual stage and you're showing that they are progressing in their own way which all children naturally do then it's more important to focus on that Mm -hmm. and I guess um like we were saying it's important to be able to communicate that to parents and to carers and in terms of um working with families how do what does it look like preparing families for that transition because it's not just supporting them and understanding how they prepare their child but it's preparing them as well I guess mentally because it is a difficult transition you know for them as well it's um it's an emotional transition for the family it is it's very emotional you know you get a overwhelming feeling of pride you know when your child Mm -hmm. is in school and a feeling of loss because you know you feel gosh mm. they're growing and you know they've come yeah. to this some parents feel really happy <laughs> because of like oh, what in school yeah um you know and it's mm. about meeting parents at their emotional needs and I think it's very very important as educators to build those positive relationships with parents because mm. you know parents are the children's first first teachers you know yeah. the first quarter mm-hmm. of the call you know and the children you know their children will get so much from the parents and what they have in their setting in their home life then you know obviously coming into school um so it's very very important I think to establish those positive relationships and also have some understanding as well because you know families are very very diverse children will have children coming in from very very all different walks of life um mm-hmm. And it's about understanding a bit more about their personal life as well, because that mm-hmm. will ultimately have an impact on how the children behaves, learns, concentrates and, you know, goes forward in school too. Mm-hmm. 
I guess it's really seeing each family as unique in their own way and understanding their needs and not just seeing that as the unique child actually it's the whole family it's our duty of care to be there for the family and understand the family yeah I, I, yeah it really is and um and also it, it's a safe space for families to be able to communicate about their children I think mm-hmm. some people feel very embarrassed about their children's behavior and you know potentially mm-hmm. you know and actually there's no embarrassing behavior for children it's it's, it's just behavior it's just it's, how it is yeah it's, it's, just it's just not good it's not bad you know even when a child is having a tantrum on the floor you know you unpick it and you get behind the um the reasons why and you know it's it's you shouldn't ever 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 feel embarrassed you know because of Mm -hmm. your child and what they're doing I think it's really important for schools to say we are a safe space you come and tell Mm -hmm. us if you have trouble with your child's behavior at home because we want to help Um, yeah it's I was going to say when you mentioned kind of a child having a tantrum it's it's them showing that they need support in uh, self-regulating and co-regulating and it's just a sign isn't it like mm-hmm. it's not good or bad it's a sign that something there needs to be addressed and supported yeah absolutely and um and it's also good actually for children to have these breakdowns because through every single breakdown you they actually you can actually teach them so much more about the reasons behind the behavior if, if you mm-hmm. know what I mean. so Quite a common one is, you know, for example, they, there's a lot of expectation for children at a very early age to be able to share and turn take. When actually mm-hmm. look at a child's development, that's a very hard thing for a child to do. Yeah. It, all the way up, I'd say, even until the age seven or eight. Um, mm-hmm. And so you have this expectation that suddenly your, your child is going to come into to reception or even at home and you think, oh, why, well, you know, they've just snatched this toy, you know, or, or mm-hmm. they're not sharing. Well, actually, it's a really difficult thing and they're not quite mentally ready yet to do that. So as educators, it's about giving children the tools in order to build up to sharing and not mm-hmm. having an initial expectation as soon as they come into your classroom, oh, this is what they all should be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Opportunities to learn through not sharing and then yeah. I'm picking it that way not thinking well this is what they have to do this is you know and being really hard on them when they don't mm-hmm. it's actually allowing them to have that opportunity to have that you know tantrum or deregulation mm-hmm. you can only teach through that yeah um, and it makes it, it the child then Just quickly, I wanted to thank all the listeners for tuning into the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Those of you who are regular listeners will know that a new episode comes out every Monday morning, ready for your commute, morning coffee, or that reflective start to the week to get you thinking and in the zone. If you haven't already done so, it would really help this podcast to keep going if you subscribe to the channel that you're listening on. The Voice of Early Childhood podcast can be found on 19 different podcast platforms and on YouTube. So it's highly likely that you, your friends and colleagues can find it on your favourite streaming platform. So please do hit the subscribe button and this will help us to keep putting out thought-provoking, reflective and insightful episodes with a wide range of guests. Thank you. I'll let you get back to the episode now. Yeah, it needs to be in context, doesn't it? We can't teach a child child something that they haven't been um, able to um, experience and kind of have a go at. They need to feel those emotions around sharing or not having something shared with them so then they can understand and also build their empathy towards you know another child when they are not sharing with them mm-hmm. and it's those challenges that help them to grow isn't it that, those difficulties that help them to understand well this is this is the situation we're talking about rather than telling the child you need to share well what does share look like that's an abs- that's just a word it's an it's an abstract concept yes yes exactly absolutely right yeah I think it's difficult sometimes um I was having a conversation with someone earlier actually um it's difficult to allow for, for families, for parents or carers to allow their child to to not share and have a bit of a squabble, a disagreement, you know, with another child and, and have a, a little bit of a, a kick and a scream and, and a bit of a fight because you, you mm-hmm. want to support them in that situation. But actually it's important to, like you say, give them a chance to um, experience that difficult scenario so then they can know how to be able to respond differently. And we can actually 
then as adults, we're given the opportunity to guide them through that scenario rather than just saying, actually, let's stop all of this. We need to um, eliminate any kind of challenge. It's an opportunity. It's a learning opportunity, isn't it? It is. And it's about retraining the neural pathways. So, you know, for example, a child who typically finds it difficult to share you know the neural pathways aren't quite there yet they don't as it mm-hmm. completely like what you said they don't truly understand what sharing is they might have heard the word but yeah to a child it's very very real and I always say this to, to a parent who comes to me with a question about sharing and turn taking I'll say well imagine I come up to you and I'm, I just take your phone and I say mm-hmm. well it's your turn now you, you've, you've had it all day now it's my turn you know mm-hmm. you'd very upset about that now as adults you know we learn different ways on how to control that we know what's exceptional what's acceptable in the social norms and what isn't and so it's about kind of allowing children to develop that for themselves and um Mm -hmm. top of obviously kind of thinking okay well if you snatch it doesn't it's not the best way of you know Mm -hmm. having your and it's you know and we we talk about that because a lot of the time you'll find quite commonly a child might take something and be like well, that's sharing. Sharing is caring. And we actually know mm-hmm. sharing isn't about taking. And so it's, it's exactly what you said. It's about allowing them those opportunities to mess up because mm-hmm. they're not going to learn through always doing the right thing. Um, and that's, again, as you said, as educators, we can then come in and we can talk to them and we can sort of think, OK, well, where did this you know, go wrong and how can we help them and support them within this? Mm-hmm. And of yeah. course, as they get older and their brains develop, you know, neural pathways change and um you know they have more of an idea about what you know what sharing is and it can really really help then you know for them to learn how to do it as they get older Mm -hmm. and um that reminds me of I'm sure you've heard the the recent episode um Tamsin Grimmer discussed kind of consent you know it's a similar thing that what what we're talking about and it's teaching children to be able to say no which is really important um but it also makes me think about like um the topic of delayed gratification um, that's a very difficult concept for children to be able to understand. And sometimes as adults, you know, we, well, often we have to have delayed gratification. Um, and sometimes it's actually better for us um, in terms of, you know, like, oh, well, if we if we exercise, you know, then we wait for those results or like we may treat ourselves after we've had a bit of exercise and things like that. Um, and I guess it's important to teach children that sometimes we can't always get what we want. So sometimes we do have to share, even if we don't want to, we do have to, to share even if we think no I've said no and this is my decision and this is me giving you um insight into whether I'm ready to share or not but sometimes you still you you have to (laughs) so I think it's just such a difficult concept to to balance to teach and and to get it right especially for for parents or carers they think they need to get it right but it's not always a right or wrong completely yeah and that's it and I think you know yeah as, especially as a parent I mean I'm, I'm a parent myself I've got two small girls uh, five mm-hmm. and seven and um you know and, and I find myself kind of thinking well my children aren't sharing right now and I'm meant to be an early <laughs> <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> it's but you know it, but it's just like we were saying it's just about providing those opportunities and then one day you'll realize oh look they're sharing without mm-hmm. you, you know intervene in here and it's the same for the children in your class they all get there it's about providing mm-hmm. stepping stones up to it yeah yeah and that's like you said it's all about that transition it's not expecting them to be able to suddenly be able to share or like we said suddenly be able to um kind of be ready for school it's that the word is transition <laughs> often we kind of forget about that even when we discuss transitions we just think oh yeah they're transitioning into school or transitioning into this um aspect of their kind of development therefore they need to be able to get it because they're at this stage or age now but actually it's all such a process and a journey that sometimes I guess it does end up going backwards kind of regressing doesn't it and and that's something that I think is important to allow families to understand it's not always going to be moving forward and progressing smoothly Mm. and plus of course you have a wide variety of ages joining you know the Mm summer-born children will be, you know, might struggle with more things than, for example, an autumn-born child, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, you know, you forget that these children, some of them have literally just turned four, you know, Mm -hmm. a week or day before you're set Mm -hmm. in, they just turned four. 
And if you think about child development and how much they have learned in their short little lives up until three, they've mm-hmm. learned, you know, the basics of being able to um, crawl, to, to, to walk, to then talk, to then form sentences, to then make sense of those mm-hmm. words, and their sentences, then make sense of expectations of how they should and shouldn't behave. All mm-hmm. of those three years, those three, those three small years of being here. And then, you know, suddenly it's four. And it's like, oh, magic number. You can now mm-hmm. do everything. It's, that's not it. It's As I said, it's all about encouraging those um, children to be able to develop in their own time and at their own space. And I think that is the most important message I want to say here today about about transition. It's all about encouraging the individual ch- children or the child. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, like we just said, not having those instant expectations that this is how it should be just because they've, they're four now and just because they started school. Mm-hmm. And um, kind of going back to the, those family expectations and supporting families, you said that it's so important to build that trust and build a relationship with the family. Um, but as a as a teacher, how do you do that in that first kind of period, transition period when you get new children coming in? And I know that there's, you know, there's been kind of home visits and visits to the setting, but they're, they're still quite short in comparison yeah. to, um, yeah, seeing the child every single day now in, in mm-hmm. September. Um, how do you, what, what do you do to be able to really build that trust? Because it needs to be quite quick, doesn't it, with, with oh, families, because you need to support them through that transition. You do, you do. And it's and that is, I think, you've got quite a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Because, mm-hmm. for example, 30 children in your class and, you know, and, and, a, and a variety of family members, and it's not always mum and dad who now picks yeah. up you know, it's grandma or a childminder or they go to after school club. So it's very, very hard, actually, sometimes to even develop those relationships. So, you know, a, a little bit of advice I can give is, for example, if you use a platform like you know something like tapestry or something like that some sort Mm -hmm. of or google classroom or or whatever platform you use Mm -hmm. it's really lovely to be able to encourage you know parents to be able to share what the child does at home and obviously you share what what they do at school but also I always um for example will try and like write personal comments and you know make sure that I'm really responding to what the parent has to show me or, or or put on well, and also, obviously, you know, you've got email as well, which is always a good mm-hmm. way to communicate just to say, oh, you know, your child has done really well today. They've settled beautifully or I was really proud of them, you know, because it is really hard to catch them at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. You know, mm-hmm. Really, really difficult. You're obviously busy, you know, safeguarding you know, trying to get the children to the right people and making sure, mm-hmm. you know, they're all cared for. So I always try and make some time to do that, um, to make sure you are communicating with the parents I think communication is truly the key here yeah um, if, as you know and, and and try and do that as much as you can I know it's really difficult um sometimes as I just said but I think it is important to spend at least I always say to myself on um for example I'm going to make sure I, I leave a comment about what you know the children in my class at least once a week just a little personal one even if it's just oh I'll catch them at the gate today and say oh I was really proud of this child yesterday because for example they did mm-hmm. the by themselves and it's just making sure you've got that at the back of your mind and I think mm-hmm. as a parent myself it's lovely to hear that about your child because you often wonder well what are they doing at school you know, yeah, you, you, they come out of school and like, oh, what have you done today? Oh, nothing. I've just played. It's like, well, yes, you have played, but you know. So it's nice to mm-hmm. hear those comments as well. Mm-hmm. Even like you say, even if it's just something short and sweet, you know, mm-hmm. um, on on a platform, then that's still communication. It's just remembering that it's important to keep that communication going. It doesn't have to be um, long emails and, and things like that. Um, and I guess another part, which kind of transitions into that the final aspect of what we're talking about in terms of the setting the school or the educator getting ready for children rather than necessarily children getting ready for school is um ensuring that families feel welcome and children can see themselves in the setting and being represented because all families look different um and there's you know carers and not just parents so how does what does that look like in your school how how does the school how do the educators get ready for the new families and children coming in and making sure that they feel part mm-hmm. of the setting from the, the minute they step in. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much diversity, as I said. So it's really nice to know whether, you know, the child, children speak an additional language at home, what countries mm-hmm. parents perhaps have heritage in or themselves. And just lots of wonderful ways you can do that in the early years, which is one of the reasons mm-hmm. why I absolutely love the early years. And mm-hmm. um, for example, you can just have like, obviously, lots of different um Faith books, you know, on display you could even have like interest tables of, you know, children who get bringing things from home, you know, to, mm-hmm. to play on the table so they can talk about their home life. And, you know, you can lead a discussion, you know, you can even set show and tells around it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the most important thing is making sure you integrate it just within their, their daily routines in the classroom, mm-hmm. not just having a, like a little, oh, well, you know, we're going to have a... I don't know, a lesson about this today. It's about making sure they're well supported. So having lots of different like, um, well, the, the really basic things as probably people know is, you know, having like, you know, different language cards displayed around the role play area, having different mm-hmm. foods in the, you know, in the role play area as well that children can handle. Yeah. And, that. and just giving them those those opportunities to be able to talk about familiarity, familiarization from home to mm-hmm. school. Mm-hmm. So really ensuring that that again that communication is the most important thing because it's important to understand what the child sees at home or within their community and then that can be implemented or replicated um, Mm -hmm. or can influence the resources in the setting yeah absolutely and I think um a lovely way to do that is you can do it very simply I mean we give out a booklet just it just says all about me and we give it to the parents and mm-hmm. they can fill out a little bit more and a child can you know take part and you have like a child voice section that they can obviously oh, lovely that so it gives us a little mm-hmm. bit oh okay well look, this this child does this at home and then as I said we can help plan for it within the setting Mm-hmm. I really like that you mentioned that the child's voice. It's so important to include the child, um, especially during this transition period. So um, in terms of and uh, helping families to understand child's voice, do you uh, communicate with them, kind of encourage them to understand that it's not just verbal? Because obviously it can take many different forms. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, it can take many different forms, but also it's encouraging children to be able to display physically what they can do and feel proud of that. I think mm-hmm. the, key, the key thing about a ch- children's voice is ownership. You know, the mm-hmm. more um, the child has a sense of ownership of their new set in their classroom, the more mm-hmm. they're going to respect it, look after it, and, and talk about it as well. And it's making sure you encourage that and give them opportunities that, to have that ownership of the classroom. And as we said, that familiarisation from home until school is super important, making sure you mm-hmm. know for example, some of the achievements that they, they've done at home and, you know, mm. being able to praise it and reward it at school as well. Mm-hmm. Do you have like a set time in the day, perhaps, that you like share these things? I know some settings do and some settings have removed kind of circle time and they really disagree with that. But some settings still find that very valuable, may just kind of um, call it a different thing and, and it may look different in each setting do you have I guess like what I'm saying is group time where you share these things or what does that look like in your setting well, what I tend to do is, is there's lots of different ways you can integrate that in I mean very simply just into registration you know when a child comes mm-hmm. in they self-register you, you will just say oh you know hello you know well done and oh well, what tell me something you did at home yesterday or you know tell me what you ate for mm-hmm. dinner last night and it just anything that prompts a little conversation you know about what mm-hmm. they to um or even about the school what are you looking forward to doing most today you know and and they will say Mm -hmm. oh I can't wait to go and play outside um so it's just encouraging that little individual attention as well and again Mm -hmm. what what we were saying about developing relationships it's also obviously very super the most important thing is developing the relationship with the child Mm -hmm. you're you're a stranger to them when they first come into the um so you know making sure you are you know very basic things on their level talking to them and it's really difficult when you've got 30 children or or so yeah yeah. (laughs) it feels like an impossible mission but Mm -hmm. making sure you have that time and I think one of the great things about working in the early years is you have those opportunities for that time in your small group work that you do Mm -hmm. um and, and and again I catch myself even then I mean I love doing um it's called like the weekly write and I say write loosely mm-hmm. because, as we said, you know, they all develop in different ways. Yeah. You, you know, we, we we have like a book, for example, and we'll talk about you know, a story 
And then I'll mm-hmm. try to encourage them, you know, to kind of do their own like drawing or writing or, or it, they're not ready for that. You know, we, we would just basically work on our voca- vocabulary. Mm-hmm. But even within that, I'll say, for example, if we're reading a book about the sea, I'll say, oh, have you ever been to the beach? And then they might tell me about a time they've been to the beach, you know. Mm-hmm. As I said, it's just encouraging those tiny little ways of ownership into the class and familiarisation. Mm-hmm. And like you say about children's voice as well, bringing their voice in through all these little snippets, all these daily conversations um, mm-hmm. and perhaps bringing things from home, whether it may be kind of physically like a drawing or a photograph, if um, if that could really support the child in terms of that medium for communication, in terms of, you know, yes. the, the verbal communication may not always be that easy for a mm-hmm. child, especially if um, perhaps English is not their first language as well. And that is the language of the setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's a really um, good point. I mean, in, in a previous setting, we um, asked the parents to provide the child with a family picture and we put them mm-hmm. all down the home corner. And it was a lovely discussion point to start our interest on families. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think it's really lovely to have those visual cues around the classroom as well. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to ensuring that children do feel a part of the setting mm-hmm. and they see they literally see themselves as yeah. you know in the setting. And it is like their second home, really. And they do spend a lot of time, even when they go to school, you know, it's a a shorter day than maybe what they're used to if they've been to nursery or preschool or a childminder but it's still it still needs to feel like their home doesn't yeah. it yeah yeah and it needs to feel somewhere where they feel safe to be themselves mm-hmm. yeah that's a really good point um well I think we'll leave it there um for this one because we've discussed all the the kind of the key points that we plan to discuss <laughs> um and then we can pick things up perhaps um in another episode and um and also um in kind of article format so thank you so much Hayley for um joining and sharing this this space with myself and all the listeners it's been great having you on oh thank you so much for having me I've really enjoyed our conversation today brilliant thank you very much thank you